All right, greetings, uh, Daniel back again. This is a video that some of you have requested after my interview with Bellamy Foster on Lukacs and the Destruction of Reason text. Uh, for folks that are not aware, we hosted a conference on the later work of Lukacs. And one of the big um, sort of difficulties of what he brings about in his later work, The Destruction of Reason, is the lineage of irrationalist philosophy starting out of, well, really out of Kant uh, is, is where it stems from. So what I'd like to do in this video is just give a little bit of a, a talk and an overview on um, the value of understanding and of centering a commitment and a critique of irrationalist thought. And I would like to do that by uh, going back to what's called neo-Kantianism. Feel free to ask any questions that you wish uh, in, the, in the comments. So I think that it is um, very useful to remember Marx's statement that the ideas of the ruling class in, in the epoch are the ruling ideas. So if Hegel says that the task of the philosopher is to comprehend one's own time in thought, philosophy from a Marxist point of view must therefore differentiate the ruling ideas, the illusory ideas, from the true ideas in one's own time. Thus, you could say from a Marxist point of view, whatever you think about the question of Marxism and philosophy, that philosophy is about arriving at a knowledge of the present. And if the predominant ideas of the ruling class are the predominant ideas for how we understand social reality, this means that the philosopher must actively avoid the ruling ideas. So um, Marx philosophically, of course, it's a huge debate whether Marx is a philosopher, whether Marxism is more best to be thought of as a practice versus a philosophy. But putting that the debate to the side for a moment, we have to understand that Marx emerges within a lineage of German idealist thought, particularly Kant. And I want to begin by showing, and of course, by the way, we can track different lineages. I mean, Leszek Kolakowski in Main Currents of Marxism identifies Marx with Neoplatonism as its origin and tries to show in a pretty interesting way that Marxism is actually a philosophy that is meant to um, <clears throat> address uh, the kind of finite contingent uh, status of the human's predicament and sort of this more um, almost almost quasi, of course, it would be secular by the time of Marx, but quasi spiritual um, question of, of of deep human emancipation. So Marx can be thought in Neoplatonist lineage, but I want to actually uh, situate Marx in a Kantian fashion. Of course, by the way, there are a lot of thinkers from Lucien Goldman to Kojin Karatani who actually try to show that uh, Kant and Marx are not to be thought of as a great schismatic. They're not to be thought of as necessarily adversarial with one another. Um, Lukács does actually see Kant as the antithesis to Marxist, to the Marxist project. And I, what I'm about to say hopefully will clarify that. So as you know, uh, Kant put forward what he calls a great Copernican revolution in philosophy. He radically upended empiricism and rationalism. Kant asks what the conditions of the possibility of knowledge truly are. And he showed that empiricism or sense-based knowledge and rationalism, knowledge that is not relying on sense or experience, both were inadequate because they were unable to demonstrate how thought is able to know its own object. Of inquiry. So for Kant, what is merely apparent to the senses is only partially cognizable since it cannot be fully known. This is based on Kant's distinction between judgments of perception as sensory and without knowledge and judgments of experience that combine sensory and formal components in which we do have knowledge. But the key point is that there remains a residue of an unknowable uh, when judgments of perception are brought under the categories 
and transformed into judgments of experience. This is what is called the Kantian thing in itself. The thing in itself refers, therefore, to this epistemological limit to knowing objective reality. Now, Kant posits this incognizable residue that resists all efforts at knowledge. And this is something which, if you think about it, from a Hegelian standpoint, is one of the primary points at which Hegel will dispute Kant, precisely because if the task of the philosopher is to gain some knowledge of the present, in a sense, the Kantian, the Kantian notion of the noumenal or the thing in itself blocks such a prospect, right? So what I wish to suggest is that we can understand irrationalism by understanding the Kantian thing in itself. Or put differently, we can understand irrationalism as a a series of philosophical strategies to confront and to deal with the Kantian thing in itself. This is the origin of irrationalism. So we should not think of Lukács' use of the term irrationalism in some colloquial sense as like um, merely beyond reason. No, it actually refers to this um, constitutive split within philosophy itself, which produces the subject-object dualism, right? Which um, ha, put, puts forward stakes on the very status of what is knowable. And for Hegel, um, the question about what is knowable falls into the question about history and man's historical place within history, which we're going to get to in a moment. So, if objective reality cannot be known, um, when this condition cannot be overcome, access to knowledge is therefore thought in an irrationalist framework. For example, this gives way to what Lukács calls aristocratic epistemology, which again is an offshoot of post-Kantian European philosophy. We see it in Schelling, we see it in Schopenhauer, and later we see it in Nietzsche. Now, a characteristic of aristocratic epistemology is that the philosopher concocts an epistemology in which there are thought to be unbridgeable differences across humans, such as we find in Nietzsche. Um, and in this notion for Nietzsche, unbridgeable differences must be actually affirmed and uh, across ethics, across morals, across politics, right? So therefore, there is a kind of insistence on absolutizing differences and then seeking justification for that absolutization in philosophy, right? Now, that actually has a very important political consequence, which is that um, you've taken the uh, Kantian noumenal and you've... Um, naturalized it uh, uh, to justify, this is one of the effects of aristocratic epistemology, there are others, is that it naturalizes um, a, a conception of uh, human relations or human society in which absolute differences are uh, natural features of social reality. So in a sense, it um, ossifies this irrational point of unknowability towards quite uh, brutal ends. Another tendency of irrationalism, and that the, of course, is that the philosopher abandons dialectics and history as knowable, right? As knowable categories of thought. Now, this brings us to German neo-Kantianism. German neo-Kantianism developed in two geographical areas. Uh, with two tendencies. The first is a philosophy of science in Marburg, and the second is as a philosophy of culture and history in Heidelberg. For Lukács, it was the Marburg school that was most formative. In this orientation, neo-Kantian philosophers claimed that there is an epistemological sort of incapacity of ascertaining certain forms of historical knowledge, and therefore, the science of history cannot be determined by subjective 
or intellectual categories. The goal of history is simply the reproduction and the analysis of what occurred in history. So history, therefore, uh, unlike for Hegel, uh, does not provide a higher logic. One important neo-Kantian thinker for Lukács, but also for Max Weber and for many uh, other German philosophers is Heinrich Rickert. Now, Rickert claimed that there is an irrational separation between concept and reality and between subjectivity and objectivity. And he develops this in his work called The Object of Knowledge, where he says that the subject independent reality cannot be conceived. And the best we can arrive at um, is, in terms of a transcendental knowledge, would be values. This is why actually Max Weber, in his theory of values, um, really, really relies on Rickert a lot. Rickert also contends that while there are many good reasons to reject what he calls psychological idealism, um, if one holds fast to consciousness in general, he says there's no good reason to posit the existence of a transcendental, of a transcendent reality beyond the sphere encompassed by the epistemological subject or the Kantian subject. His theory of knowledge is therefore committed to what he calls transcendental idealism, right? From this position of transcendental idealism, Rickard argued that all reality, both psychic and physical, is encompassed by a general form of subjectivity. Now, um, he called this, by the way, this transcendental idealism, the standpoint of true realism. And he used the term standpoint, which is very important for Lukács' later development. And he says that transcendental idealism refuses to counterpose an imminent psychic reality to an inaccessible transcendent reality. Thus, Rickert insisted that transcendental idealism considers real precisely the reality that we encounter in everyday life through sensory experience, which consists of immediately aware psychic and physical occurrences. But he rejects that reality can be meaningfully constructed as transcendent vis-a-vis -vis consciousness in general. So again, Rickert brings us back to the problem of the Kantian thing in itself and its unknowability. For Lukács, reason has to go beyond the Kantian and the neo-Kantian limit imposed on knowing the thing in itself. Otherwise, knowledge of the social context in which we find ourselves in would basically be impossible. And therefore, the Marxist entire Marxist project would also be impossible philosophically. Now, the name that I want to give to this um, push against neo-Kantian unknowability is totality. Totality. Totality can be defined as a resolution to the Kantian subject-object split that animates German idealism. And of course, there are different solutions to this conundrum. For example, Fichte deduces the solution purely in a subjective way. Through the subject's own activity, the idea of absolute being can ground itself. For Fichte, the ego, the person or the self, consists in its power to be a cause to itself. In this sense, Fichte errs because he's too much of a subjective activist. He's ultra subjectivist in his solution. Hegel takes a more dialectical approach than does Fichte. And of course, Hegel's approach to this Kantian problem will be the most consequential and the most important for Marx. For Hegel, there are objective forms of bourgeois society that must be thought in their contradictory doubleness, in their splitness, as moments of a process in which man or mind 
discovers itself in these moments of contradictory alienation. Man comes to himself at these points of contradiction where his existence is driven to extremes. And what is produced in these moments of alienation are actually the objective possibility of the sublation of the contradictions themselves. So Hegel combines a historical and a philosophical approach by showing that both history and the present are mired, are stuck in what Hegel calls immediacy. Therefore, the true philosophical deduction that is, that is needed is through the development of higher concepts and categories so that they so that, that that history can be demonstrated to consist of a continual transformation of forms of the present and earlier forms that were themselves always stuck in the immediacy of the present so there's much to be said about hegel's method but i'm trying to distill it to drive at this question of totality In that sense, Hegel's method must be understood at, as an attempt to arrive at knowledge of the present. Therefore, it contains within itself all the contradictions of the present. But Hegel puts these contradictions in the form of a new methodology of the dialectic. And the dialectic is meant to, to detect how the contradictions of the present can arrive at a higher logic. But importantly, Hegel's method needs to be supplemented. It needs to be flipped on its head. And this is obviously what Marx and Engels will do. Because Hegel stops his critique at the present, what he calls reconciliation. Or he directs the dialectical movement to a formal standstill in a more contemplative region where social forms are mediated in what Hegel calls absolute spirit. So Hegel provides a way, a solution to the failure to cognize the present, which is a failure that the neo-Kantians are fine with, right? Um, but his method overall is inadequate. Now, one of the ways that we see this inadequacy of, Hegel, of Hegel's method is in the Communist Manifesto. And in the Communist Manifesto, Marx and Engels discuss and they critique what are called the what they call the true socialists. Bruno Bauer, Moses Hess, and Ludwig Feuerbach, as well as Ferdinand LaSalle, fall into this category of a kind of revolutionary intelligentsia, right? These are kind of uh, utopian socialists. Uh, these are um, idealist socialists, so they are revolutionary socialists, but they err. And part of the reason that they err is because of the way that they read Hegel's dialectics. They were committed to a revolutionary position, Lukács says, of course. These are, these are also, of course, the young Hegelians, for which Marx and Engels were a part of the young Hegelians. Over time, they break from the young Hegelians. But the primary reason that they erred, according to Lukács, has to do with the way that they misconstrued the, their own standpoint in relationship to the questions of revolution that they posed. They thought revolution far too abstractly. They thought revolution as grounded in an overcoming of alienation of humanity in a too universal sense, right? They thought that unmasking the alienated in human nature will somehow magically bring about the, a new conscious discovery of man and of humanity as such. In a sense, they were naively universalist. Now, Marx and Engels... Um, argue that the true socialists uh, sought um, the conditions of socialism 
within the misty realm of ideas, not from the standpoint of the proletariat. Therefore, just as Hal Draper will remark, what is most novel about Marx and Engels in the history of socialism is the fact that they sought out a theory of socialism from the standpoint of the proletarian working class. And this is, there's two things that Lukács will say is most central about Marx. That's the first one, the standpoint of the proletariat as realizing uh, the imminent overcoming of the system. The only way to think the totality is through the standpoint of the proletariat. So if the true socialists have an inadequate relationship to philosophy because they miss the way that philosophy must ground its standpoint in the standpoint of the proletariat, one of the interesting passages that Marx makes in uh, his analysis of Hegel's philosophy of right is that the emancipation of one nation, in this case, he says the German nation, will result in the emancipation of man. And then he says the head of this emancipation is philosophy, its heart, the proletariat. Philosophy cannot realize itself without the transcendence of Hebun, of the proletariat, and the proletariat cannot transcend itself without the realization of philosophy. So, we can understand this in three ways. First, the proletariat is the class that represents the future and of all classes, and the possibility of the dissolution of the class system of capitalism. Not, not in a teleological sense. I said possibility, not, not necessity. Two, philosophy needs the proletariat because only the proletariat can share in the transition from theory to practice. Philosophy, and the third, philosophy and the proletariat rely on each other and the realization of both results in the abolition of both. Therefore, in an interesting way, the Marxist definition of philosophy is actually very close to Wittgenstein's definition of philosophy. Wittgenstein said that philosophy only sets problems that it can solve. Its philosophical problem is only meaningful if and only if it can possibly be solved in a practical manner. So then what is the practical aim of philosophy for Marxism? I would argue the practical aim of philosophy is to bring about human freedom. And human freedom in capitalist society requires the activation and the organization of the proletariat as the class to end all classes. Now, in Lukács' work, History and Class Consciousness, the proletariat is thought as an agent of becoming. And you have to link it back to this conundrum that Kant and Neo-Kantianism put forward, which is this dualism uh, uh, related to the drive for totality, or what is sometimes called the, the subject-object split. This means that the proletariat is a rational solution to the problem of the realization of philosophy as such. The proletariat's activation in class struggle will recover philosophy's intrinsic social utility. But what does this mean, the becoming identical subject object? This returns us to the problem of totality and to the question of the whole of society, of social relations, which I think we can understand as a process in which the object by object, we mean the social context and the subject by which we mean the proletariat produces its own object as a condition of knowledge. So if the primary method of Marxism is knowledge of the present and bourgeois reason, which is instantiated or represented in neo-Kantianism in some sense, is incapable of fully grasping social reality, this means that Marxism can be thought 
to have identified a distinct form of reason that is different from neo-Kantian reason. To quote Lukács in History and Class Consciousness, the conceptual defect of the bourgeoisie is not merely a failure to understand political economy. If the economic dimension following from the commodity permeates contemporary society as a whole, then society is literally uncognizable, that is unknowable from the bourgeois perspective, which means that the condition of what Lukács calls reification or the tendency for the logic of the commodity to envelop forms of life in bourgeois society, what that means is that a class-centered analysis allows for the possibility of an overcoming of reification. So therefore, the class standpoint is capable of granting access to the knowability of the present in the totality of the system. Now, this claim operates on a correlation between forms of reason and the class structure in society. If there is a kind of universal proletarian perspective, it would have to be embodied in a perspective which is opposed and distinct from the perspective of the world that drives the capitalist or the bourgeois perspective. But how do we know that the proletarian position is not itself another form of illusory knowledge? This would obviously be a counter contention of someone like Nietzsche in his doctrine of perspectivism, right? How do we know that the proletarian position is capable of accessing a higher truth? Lukács is not a class reductionist here, and nor is he too economistic in his thinking. He says in History and Class Consciousness, quote, it is not the primary, the primacy of economic motives in historical explanation that constitutes the decisive difference between Marxism and bourgeois science. It is rather the point of view of totality. So we can understand this almost as a syllogism. If social reality must presuppose the integration of the manifold aspects of the social context from the vantage of the social totality, and the bourgeois position in society cannot grasp the totality, having to do with the subject's relation to labor, only the proletarian position is capable of grasping the higher logic of the totality and therefore gaining access to social reality in a way that is truly transformative. So the difference here is also not only the relationship of the proletarian subject to labor and the mode of production, but also to interest to their interest. There is a material difference between the bourgeois and the proletariat from a materialist point of view. Now, Lukács claims that the possibility of revolutionary social change is lodged at the level of the consciousness and the activation of the consciousness of the proletariat. And what this means is that the activation of the proletariat will have a greater effect on possibly changing social conditions, then will the activation of bourgeois consciousness alone. Of course, that's not to say that in some rigid sense, um, only working class and uh, middle class, it's not that way at all. And you'll see why in a moment. But if we accept the primary thesis of Marx, that the class struggle is the driving logic of social of historical life men do not make history of their choosing but under circumstances directly encountered given and transmitted from the past as marx says then we can see that the proletariat is discovered in the revolutionary working class this does not mean that the entirety of the working class must become conscious of its unique role as a revolutionary vanguard to overcome reified, alienated social life. But what it does mean is that for the proletariat to become the identical subject object of history, if the dialectic is a method that can lead to knowledge of the whole, which is a knowledge of society as a historical totality, what this means is that the developing tendencies of history constitute a higher reality than the merely empirical facts. Now this 
idea means that the proletariat only discovers itself through a moment of revolutionary struggle and agitation in which it's capable of seeing itself as a decisive agent within that revolutionary sequence and struggle. This is why you cannot think the activation of class consciousness outside of struggle in a purely contemplative way as some kind of armchair academic exercise. No, it has to be actively and practically engaged with through the sequences of struggle. In this sense, uh, you're introduced to an interesting ethical conundrum, which needs to be discussed from the point of view of Marxist ethics, which is something that liberals, and here I don't mean neoliberals, I mean classical liberal critics of Marxism, such as Kolakowski, have argued, even against Lukács, that at a moment of class struggle in which the higher logic of the historical thrust of the proletariat's realization of self-consciousness is occurring, one of the dangers is the justification that this higher logic and their participation in this higher logic can quite easily uh, go to negate empirical reality of what's actually occurring within the historical sequence. We could talk about uh, aspects of Stalinism in this regard, for example. I do not propose to uh, bring a solution to this, but merely to flag it as something we can discuss in the future. But here is what Lukács will say about what it means for the consciousness of the proletariat to be engaged in a struggle in which there occurs an identical subject-object. Imagine a political process in which the working class is activated in an ongoing struggle for its own liberation. And they become aware of their role as the catalyst, as the primary point within the repertoire of struggles occurring. That if they don't continue, then the dialectic effectively is impaled. It stops, it ceases. M M Lukács says it's only when the work revolutionary working class is capable of seeing its uh, agency as necessary to the unfolding of history that this identical subject object occurs. But this does not result in some immediate utopia. What it results in is the transformation of the capitalist system. You could say, in a sense, that it results in the seizure of power of working class is one way to think about it. When it is only when the consciousness of the proletariat awakens to a consciousness of this process, realized in practical struggle that they are engaged in, that the proletariat becomes the identical sub subject object of history, whose practice can change reality. In other words, when the proletariat sees its own role within the class struggle as formative and consequential, only then will it muster the wherewithal to decisively act. Therefore, the proletariat must be engaged in the struggle in order to realize its necessary position in the possible overcoming of capitalism. And Lukács will add in History and Class Consciousness that this process, once it is activated, say for example today, is this process activated? You could almost create a kind of barometer, like when you go into the wilderness and you see the barometer of the threat of fire season, very high, medium, or low. One can create a barometer of class consciousness with this framework in mind. And Lukács will say, following Lenin, in Lenin's essay, What is to be done? That the revolutionary party imputes consciousness onto the working revolutionary working class. And it is only this imputed consciousness that can result in a break from what Lenin called trade union consciousness, right? And moreover, we're introduced to a very interesting Nietzschean question because Lenin will suggest that the revolutionary vanguard party imputes consciousness from a standpoint that is dis engage directly from labor as such.
So the revolutionary theorist, Lenin will suggest, and Lukács will follow Lenin in ways that he will regret in this regard, and I'll talk about that in a moment, uh, in a sense must be subtracted from the working class day-to-day -day exploitation in order to impute consciousness. Revolutionary class consciousness for Lukács, Lukács in history and class consciousness means, quote, the abolition of the isolated individual. It means that workers can become conscious of the social character of their labor. It means that the abstract universal form of the societal principle, as it is manifested, can be increasingly concretized and overcome. We thus see in this very interesting quote, two important concepts. The first is consciousness, and the second is worldview, or Weltanschauung. Consciousness, for Lukács, simply refers to a particular stage of knowledge where the subject and the object of knowledge are homogenous. This is what it means to have consciousness, where knowledge takes place from within, not from without. Thus, the consciousness of the revolutionary historical mission of the proletariat brings us back to the question of totality or the resolution of the subject-object division. The second term, worldview or Weltanschauung, what does that mean? Philosophy, unlike mathematics, is compelled to tackle fundamental questions concerned with the worldview. Now, a worldview is born from a composite and overlapping set of features um, similar in a way to what the French sociologist Pierre Bourdieu calls a habitus. That's very similar to a worldview. We can define it uh, as the subjective, not the individual, but the subjective system of internalized structures, schemas of perception, of conception and action that become common to members of a class or a group. This is a worldview. Therefore, the development and the refinement of a proletarian worldview, higher worldview, is necessary. Victor Serge, one of the great uh, journalists of Bolshevism, said that the Bolsheviks themselves, the Bolshevik revolutionaries, constituted the highest representative of what bourgeois culture was capable of, of preserving during its time. And so in a dialectical sense, the Bolsheviks absorbed the highest, although they were decadent, ideals of a, of a bourgeois society that they were seeking to radically overcome and to transform. Therefore, Lukács makes a fundamental claim in the destruction of reason, which is that the proletariat is the first oppressed class in history that is capable of realizing its oppression and creating a worldview that is higher and more learned than the than its oppressors. Hmm? In that sense, a uh, working class struggle not only must create its own art, its own aesthetics, its own intellectuals, but actually must do something more comprehensive than that. It must strive for the creation of a worldview. This is a, a core Lukacian claim, which incidentally, as you may or may not know, the value form theorist Michael Heinrich argues that historically, the tradition of what he calls worldview Marxism, which I champion and he does not, has ended, has ended uh, since the 1970s, that the possibility of a more comprehensive worldview building project is no longer on the table. This is something that I think Lukács helps us abandon and push beyond and ultimately to restore a question of worldview. Now, to return to the question of the totality, here's a good way to understand it. When the proletariat sees its own role within the class struggle and as transformative and necessary to the struggle at hand, they have touched on the totality. They have gained a knowledge of the totality. Right. So we can understand the notion of totality here as gaining a more holistic orientation 
from the standpoint of a collective standpoint. And in this moment, what is reflected in the consciousness of the proletariat is a new positive reality that arises out of the dialectical contradictions of the old order, right? And in that way, when Serge says the Bolsheviks um, combined the highest ideals of the old order only to abolish them, it's in that sense that revolution should be thought of not as a pure abolition, but as a sublation, right? As something which preserves as it overcomes. Now, at the time of writing History and Class Consciousness, Lukács argued um, something that he regretted. He said that he wrote the text from the standpoint of a messianic sectarianism. From this position, Lukács advocated a total break with every institution and mode of life that stemmed from the bourgeois worldview. He sought, therefore, an undistorted class consciousness that would be led by the vanguard, which at the time were the communist parties and the communist youth organizations. And by the way, in Hungary, Lukács was actually affiliated with a technically illegal party, which was not the uh, Soviet-sanctioned party at the time. That's very important to know because Lukács rejects what he calls his ultra-leftism in history and class consciousness by the time of 1967. Let me read this quote. He says, what I failed to realize was, was that in the absence of a basis in real praxis, in labor as its original form and model, the overextension of the concept of praxis would lead to its opposite a relapse into idealistic contemplation. My intention then was to chart the correct and authentic class consciousness of the proletariat, distinguishing it from public opinion surveys, which didn't even exist at the time, and to confer upon the proletariat an indisputably practical objectivity. So what is the problem? The problem brings us back to imputed consciousness, which uh, is a consciousness that is from the contemplative stance. In a sense, it is a consciousness that is imputed from an undiluted liberal bourgeois position. So imputed consciousness is important because it raises the question of leadership. It raises the question of worldview building amongst the proletariat. It raises also the question of theoretical inquiry amongst the working class and the danger that comes from a purely detached theoretical position. Now, of course, um, the question that will drive the later Lukács is more directly tied into the question of Marxist method in a general sense. And by that, what I mean is that uh, rationalism is a certain uh, orientation to the assessment of ideological struggle within the wider class struggle itself. To read a quote from Lukács, he says, let us consider irrationalism concretely in the ideological struggles of the age, concerned as an element and side-taking in the continual dispute repeatedly born from class conflicts between the new and old, between concretely historical progress and regression. Then we are equally bound to have a completely different illumination, a picture that comes closer to the truth. So if, as I said in the beginning, Marxist philosophy must begin with a confrontation of the fact that the ruling ideas of society are generated from the ruling class, rationalist, a rationalist orientation affirms that social realities are born from class conflicts and are knowable from the standpoint of the proletariat. Therefore, the proletarian position has an epistemic advantage, has an epistemic advantage, and that reason can be equipped 
as a weapon within the class struggle. Now, in other work that I'm developing in my forthcoming book on Nietzsche, for example, I develop the argument that liberal bourgeois ideology insists on what I call a nominalist covering over of social antagonisms, a rendering fictional of the true origin of social antagonisms. This is what Marx means axiomatically, that at any given time, the epoch is ruled by the ideas of the ruling class. The ruling class, therefore, has an interest in distorting and making illusory the consistent degradation and exploitation of social life under capitalism. All of that must be nominally covered over. Therefore, we can, we can call Marxism not only a rational orientation, but an orientation of the real over nominalism. Bourgeois thought requires that antagonisms born from class conflict and struggle be peppered over. Therefore, irrationalist philosophies work to support the nominalizing of liberal bourgeois conceptions of social reality. Marxist philosophy is about arriving at a more, a more clear sense of social reality. Now, recently, Andrew Feinberg, a great scholar of Lukács, has argued that the later Lukács of destruction of reason abandons the category of reification. In other words, he argues that Lukács abandons the theory of alienation. I want to uh, say in conclusion that I think this is a massive misnomer and a misreading of Lukács. For starters, Lukács argued that even if full objectivity is achieved, the achievement we discussed earlier of the resolution of the subject object dualism, Lukács said this would give way to irony. To have the most serious regard for things always results in a type of irony for Lukács. Keeping in mind, Lukács, of course, is a great reader of literature. So there is no utopian impulse in Lukács. To the contrary, Lukács continuously criticized utopians as romantics who thought that a natural life worthy of man can somehow magically spring from the decadent disintegration of capitalism that's always happening, especially in imperialist times. He thought utopians falsely concluded that the descending disintegration of the lifeless and life-denying social and economic categories of capitalism can be overcome by vitalism or by some appeal to the framework of life or myth. He rejected that. Utopianism for Lukács is flawed because it refuses any thinking of mediation. It thinks revolution out of the blue too abruptly. The spontaneous and direct development of proletarian class consciousness, whether under the impact of economic crises or as a result of individual self-illumination, is always a utopian dream. So there's nothing, uh, therefore, that can be thought in a direct or too quick or decisionistic way. Therefore, everything must be centered on me a theory of mediation with social forms and a theory of the centrality of political organization. In this sense, Lukács' theory of mediation aims to surpass the immediate knowledge of the historical given, which bourgeois thought claims is unknowable, right? In this way, Lukács is actually Spinozist in the sense that he finds a necessary parallel between thought and being as a condition of knowledge. So with that, please feel free to ask any questions and raise any comments. And thanks for listening.